uh, to join us here at SIRS tonight for the very first lecture, Ginkgo Lecture of 2018. My name is Melanie Gibson and I run the um, Microsoft. Sorry, I can't remember this one. That one. I think it is now. <laughs> Would you like me to start again? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Melanie Gibson and I run the um, art series in the Ginkgo Library. So our speaker tonight is Christiana Gruber. And she's been a friend of the Ginkgo now for some time. And next year, she will become a Ginkgo author with the publication of a book entitled The Image Debate. This brings together a number of essays examining the controversy surrounding the use of images in Islam and other religious cultures, with different essays on the issue as it affected pre-modern Islam, the Jewish, early Christian, Buddhist, and Hindu positions as well. And then the essays in the final section We'll look at how um, images are perceived in the modern and contemporary period. So, as you can imagine, uh, we're very excited about this book, and the lecture tonight will go on to give you all a taste of some of the questions that it addresses. So, let me tell you something about our distinguished speaker, Professor of Islamic Art in the Department of Art History at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her main field of research is devoted to the Islamic book, paintings of the Prophet Muhammad and Islamic Ascension texts and images, about which she's written three books, as well as numerous articles. And her latest book, which will shortly be out, is entitled The Praiseworthy One, and I printed up the cover, The Praiseworthy One, The Prophet Muhammad in Islamic Texts and Images. So please join me in welcoming Christiana Gruber. Thank you, Melanie. Can you hear me from this microphone? Yes, okay. Well, thank you, first of all, to Melanie and Barbara for organizing this lecture. I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing to work with you both on, on this publication. And we have some of the, the volumes essays here um, in the crowd, too. So it's a pleasure to present to you today uh, what I conceive of as the, the introductory essay uh, for the section on uh, Islamic images uh, and some of the problems and possibilities around them. Uh, the book itself is guided to a general audience and especially to students. So I steer clear of being overly jargony or uh, overly theoretical. I'll be very happy to hear from you uh, in the, the question and answer period, uh, whether you think certain areas uh, could be polished or changed since it is a, a work in progress. So without further ado, let me begin. The turn of the millennium has its fair share of challenges, from climate change to mass migration. It also has witnessed war and violence across the world, including in Muslim-majority countries. Confrontations over power and authority across the greater Middle East have taken a noticeably visual and material turn, with images serving as both symbolic stand-ins and actual targets of militant actions. Among them, in 2001, the Taliban forced local Hazara men to dynamite the Buddhas of Bamiyan, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that brought in substantial income for this minority Shi community in Afghanistan. Although these statues were originally protected under the Taliban, the group's leaders reversed their opinion in the wake of international sanctions, purposefully pulverizing these monumental sculptures through a vengeful act of quid pro quo. 15 years later, large-scale killing of humans has unfolded in Syria and Iraq, once substantial swaths of territory came under the control of militants fighting under the banner of the Islamic State. An unprecedented destruction of ancient Near Eastern, Greco-Roman, and Islamic art and architecture ensued. Among the many artworks lost or plundered, all of us remember well the moment in 2015 when ISIS soldiers took pickaxes and drills to the famous Lamassus, protecting the entrance gate of the Assyrian palace at Nineveh. Images of this iconoclastic spectacle spread quickly across the globe, in large part due to the militants' mediatized performance as recorded through a video that was widely disseminated on the internet. In the short film, a jihadi speaks on camera as he selectively mines Islamic sources to support his anti-image position. 
Above all, however, he argues that this cultural heritage that he is destroying, upon which the modern state of Iraq is built, must be dismantled in order to symbolically destroy artificial nation-state boundaries and Western colonial presence, thus paving the way for the founding of an Islamic caliphate in the Levant. These two landmark image-breaking episodes have intersected with several controversies surrounding European caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad that have unfolded over the past dozen years, including most recently the assassination of cartoonists at the offices of Charlie Hebdo in Paris just three years ago. These many dramatic and often violent confrontations have been linked in some fashion or another to figural images and therefore have precipitated a number of contemporary discourses on so-called Islamic iconoclasm in both Islamic and non-Islamic spheres. Explanations often stress the putative impermissibility of representing animals, human beings, and most importantly, the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic traditions. This rather simplistic explanation skirts much more complex political, social, and religious issues, all the while as it alters the image of Islamic art by marginalizing or overlooking rich and, a rich and varied corpus of visual and material evidence that provides a much more nuanced and flexible way to explore practices of image making in Islamic lands over the course of centuries. did not expect this slide. <laughs> As a case in point, to highlight the problems and even the paradoxes behind the so-called image problem in Islamic cultures, one need not look any further than today's Saudi Arabia. Promoting a highly austere Wahhabi or neoconservative Unitarian theology, a number of Saudi clerics have issued many public decrees or fatwas concerning both the representational arts and three-dimensional statuary. The issue of snowmen also has arisen as of late, no date due to major climactic shifts. In 2015, parts of Saudi Arabia were blanketed in snow. Surprised and entertained, individuals staged snowball fights and built snow sculptures, including of human beings and animals, most especially camels. In response, the prominent Saudi cleric, Sheikh Mohammed Saleh al-Munajid, issued a fatwa in which he declared that it is prohibited to make figures of living beings out of snow if they include facial features. He reasoned that images of animate beings are not allowed in part by citing the Prophet Muhammad's companion Ibn Abbas on the subject, quote, what matters in the case of images is the head. The image is the head. If the head is cut off, it is no longer an image." End quote. One of Munajid's followers added the further explanation in response, quote, the building of snowmen is imitating the infidels. It promotes lustiness and eroticism. End quote. So, you know, when I start to speak again, <laughs> Thus, while many Saudis rejoiced in building snow beings outfitted with facial features, others opined that such acts must remain forbidden due to a range of reasons, including the usurpation of God's creative power, the imitation of non-Muslim practices, and the promulgation of the so-called seductive arts. And yet, in Saudi Arabia, legal opinions concerning figural images are much more discordant and less strict than such proclamations may suggest. Instead, clerics and members of the House of Saud have established mutually beneficial partnerships with the clerical class when it comes to making practical decisions on images in the face of an evolving society and its many technologies. For instance, some Saudi clerics instead have highlighted the positive qualities of visual likenesses including photographic representations of the ruling members of the Saudi family. Neutralizing legal obstacles along the way, they argue that images can be used in a correct manner 
to strengthen social and religious public interest. Such visuals certainly are intended to muster political support, as evidenced by the many large-scale billboards and digital images that visually reinforce the reign of King Salman and his appointed successors and international partners, among them most recently Donald Trump. So here we have Salman and his uh, members of his family with wings flying over the Arabian Peninsula and the Kaaba. And here we have our wow and and stressing, stressing the partnership between the king and, and Donald Trump. Rather than argue against the legality of such lifelike images, clerics instead encourage their widest possible dissemination via printing and the internet by citing the hadith of the prophet heralding that, quote, God will spread Islam until it reaches every house and under every tree, end quote. Even within today's ultra-conservative Wahhabi context, the question of the figural image thus remains perennially debated, its use guided by political expediency rather than legal principle. So if we go back to the very beginnings, and if we look at the visual evidence, what do the sources say, and what do the objects have to illuminate for us? Let's go to the very beginnings. Turning first to the Quran, it is important to note that Islam's holy scripture makes few mentions of idols and images, a general silence that is striking in comparison to its repeating, repeated berating of other prohibitions, <laughs> chief among them poetry, itself Islam's quintessential form of creative expression. So poetry is lambasted in the Quran, and yet this is one of the prime creative manners of, of expressing oneself in Islamic registers. On the occasion when the question of the representational arts does arise, the Quranic text aims to signal the dawn of a new monotheistic order by castigating pagan disbelief, polyistic practices, and their associated traditions of idol making and idol worship. The Quranic accounts of the prophets Moses, Solomon, and Abraham stand out most in this regard. For instance, in its recounting of Moses destroying the golden calf, the Quran describes Moses as chastising the Israelites for having made a cult idol with the following words, quote, O my people, verily you have sinned against yourselves by taking the calf, end quote. In this verse, the term for idol, which you would think we would find, is left completely unmentioned. Rather, the emphasis is on the verb to take, or achaza. For these reasons, exegetes, interpreters of the Quran, have read this verse as inveighing against the Israelites for having taken the calf as a deity and for worship, so the use of the object and not the object itself. Here, the sculpted material item, per se, recedes to the background, while the act of venerating multiple deities emerges as the prime caveat in the story of Moses. The Quran also praises Solomon as the quintessential king, capable of controlling the winds, spirits, demons, animals, angels, and even cosmic forces. When listing the ruler's wondrous works, it goes on to note that, quote, they, the jinn, so the spirits, made for him whatever he wished of sanctuaries and statues and basins as large as great watering troughs and cauldrons firmly anchored." End quote. The term of most interest in this verse is tamathil, that is, human likenesses or similitudes, from the Arabic <laughs> methala, to be like, to resemble. However, these figural images are neither lambasted as idols or subjected to any other form of criticism. Quite to the contrary, they form part of a larger corpus of material objects that confirm the high rank of King Solomon, who is often depicted enthroned and ruling over all earthly and celestial beings in Islamic and especially Persian painting. Over the centuries, Muslim rulers crafted visions of their royal authority in palace quarters 
by drawing upon and expanding the Solomonic pattern of being encircled by statues and luxury goods. Such a use of figural likenesses in private, non-devotional contexts was neither prohibited in the Quran, nor was it a matter of contestation at the very beginning of Islam, although theological and legal debates over this very issue accelerated by the end of the 8th century. During the Umayyad period, so from 650 to 750, the desert palaces built in the Jordan Valley by members of the royal family made use of opulent decoration, including statues of humans and animals made of molded stucco overpainted in colored pigments. In the palace of Khirbat al-Mafjar, for example, the caliph, possibly Yazid II or Hisham, right here, is shown in the Bas audience, audience hall, standing frontally above two lions, holding a dagger and clad in a red robe ornamented with pearls. The bathhouse's walls and pendentives likewise display painted, painted stucco reliefs depicting animals, grapes, vines, and nude figures that may have symbolized fertility and abundance, as you can see here. These sculpted visual likenesses honor the caliph, promote his high rank, and praise the prosperity of both fauna and flora in his domains. Thus, within private palace spheres, at least, these temathi, these figural likenesses, were not shunned as false deities. Instead, they were crafted to buttress an image of the ruler's well-protected grandeur. Due to their potential use in idol worship, figural sculptures were kept out of mosques and other public arenas, at least until the rise of Siddic monuments during the 19th century, at which time European urban trends influenced artistic practices in Islamic lands. For a long time, statuary remained a prerogative of courtly life. Like the Umayyads before them, the Seljuks and Khaznavids, ruling in Anatolia and greater Iran, also outfitted their palaces with figural imagery, especially from the 11th to the 13th century. At least nine near life-size statues made of gypsum plaster are believed to have been made for the Seljuk ruler's court located in the Iranian city of Rey. And here I show you some examples of these statues. These figures have been interpreted by a number of scholars, among them Melanie Gibson, as representing elite members of the court or the ruler's personal guard, the Hasakiya, whose placement along the walls of throne halls served to reinforce the king's authority. Acting as symbolic followers and permanent protectors, these three-dimensional figural statues formed part of medieval expressions of royal power in Eastern Islamic lands, where traditions of figural depiction in stonework and wall painting stretch back to Sardiana and of, of course to Achaemenid times as well. Like their Umayyad and Seljuk precursors, modern Muslim monarchs have not shied away from ornamenting their court with figural imagery and statuary. For example, during the 19th century, the Qajar rulers of Iran received officials and dignitaries while seated on the famous marble throne, the Takht Marmar, placed within an audience hall decorated with mirror work and looking over the palace's courtyard. This throne, overtly reasserts the Solomonic paradigm through both its inscriptional and pictorial contents. <coughs> For one, the poetic verses, which you see here, my colleague is lifting a rope, but the verses surround uh, the throne here. The poetic verses cite Sabah's The Book of the King of Kings, the Shahin Shahnameh, which is an imitation of Firdausi's Shahnameh. And the verses in particular here um, are praise King Solomon as the quintessential ruler. In addition, the throne itself is upheld by animals, demons, and human figures. Here are human figures, here are demons. And the figures are perhaps intended to represent Solomon's statues as they are mentioned in the Quran. Seated in this manner on their Solomonic throne, Qajar rulers like Nasir Shah, whom you can 
barely see right here, appeared rather statuesque in their formality and elegance. For example, in this photograph by Antoine Serugin, the enthroned Iranian monarch is held aloft by creatures carved of stone, as well as acclaimed by courtiers made of flesh, who have come to convey their New Year's greetings or else uh, give him his help their hellos upon a uh, return from a trip. In addition, once ritually unveiled by the lifting of a large fabric, the ruler gleams in the sunlight as if a newly chiseled and installed statue. So we have to think of, of the performative aspect behind this photo. Originally, the ruler would have been behind this veil, and when the veil lifts up, it is almost as if a, a new statue has, has been made to appear. Nasser Adin's personal guards and military personnel to his right likewise stand erect and immobile as if they too were sculpted entities. And that's an effect that would have lasted even longer since to take this photo, you need to stand still for, for quite some time. Within the refinement and artistry of court ritual, at times it thus becomes difficult to distinguish between reality and artifice the two blending into a mythic presence that proved particularly effective in promoting an image of divine kingship. It thus becomes clear that the, the Quranic verse on Solomon's tamathil, on his statues, allowed Muslim monarchs from the first century of Islam until the present day the possibility to express their royal pedigree and power through figural images including three-dimensional statuary. In the Quranic tale of Solomon, such figural representations are praised as wondrous works of regal distinction rather than scorned as objects of pagan worship. As a consequence, these types of statues, of images, and their subsequent material iterations essentially function as symbolic tools in the support and protection of God's anointed rulers on earth. which brings us to Abraham. Complicating the matter, the term tamathil nevertheless is used in the Quran to describe heathen cult objects as well. For instance, the holy text recounts the prophet Abraham destroying the idols of the Sabaeans, a pre-Islamic people living in the South Arabian land of Sabah, which is now uh, basically Yemen, Sheba. When he saw the Sabaeans worshiping pagan statues, Abraham queried his father and people by asking, quote, and this is our first one, what are these statues to which you are so intensely devoted, end quote. In this instance, the term tamathil, otherwise a non-pejorative word meaning likenesses or similitudes, is used as a synonym for idols. Not merely figural representations, these cult objects are worshiped as deities per se. Abraham goes on to exclaim, quote, by God, I shall most certainly bring about the downfall of your idols as soon as you have turned your backs and gone away, end quote. He then finally curses his people as polytheists, as polytheists, quote, fly upon you and upon all that you worship instead of God. Will you not then use your reason, end quote. The story of Abraham destroying the idols of the Sabaeans raises a number of issues, especially insofar as it is often cited as the primary source of Quranic support for iconoclastic acts undertaken by the Taliban, ISIS, and other militant groups. Anytime ISIS puts out a video, it's always Abraham, much more so than Muhammad at the Kaaba. So Abraham is the, the paradigm in this case. First, due to the sequence of verses, image adverse in individuals and groups are quick to equate figural likenesses or temathil with pagan idols or asnam, overlooking the positive use of the former in the Solomonic tale, as well as the fact that the term temathil most likely is used here to describe anthropomorphic idols rather than roughly hewn sacred stones, also known as betels. Second, Abraham gives further meaning to his destructive act by stating explicitly that such idols 
function as stand-ins for the Sabaean's polytheistic beliefs, which he claims emerge from the irrational thought that deities reside in three-dimensional objects. Here then, Abraham is not condemning the act of figural depiction ipso facto. Rather, he takes such objects as material metaphors for a lack of logic, that is, for the so-called age of ignorance or the jahadiyya, a period before monotheism. As such, the asnam, the idols destroyed by Abraham, are nothing if not the venerated idols of a bygone irrational age, which had to be obliterated and discarded in order to usher in a more reasonable monotheistic world order. Over the centuries, many Muslim theologians, jurists, writers, and artists did not consider figural representation tantamount to idolatry. In their estimation, these two visual modes of expression differed in their ontological status and practical use, the latter erroneously allowing for the possibility of divine inhabitation and worship. Because depicting sentient beings has never been wholly pro prohibited in Islamic history, both patrons and artists saw it fit to leverage the figural mode, at times even to excori excoriate idolatry. In other words, to use images to lambast idolatry. As a case in point, a number of Persian manuscript paintings show Abraham destroying the idols of the Sabaeans. One of these, made in Ilkhan in Iran at the beginning of the 14th century, depicts the monotheistic prophet wearing a green robe and white turban, his head framed by a gold halo, as he wields an axe to three idols, one of which has fallen to the ground, as you can see. Thank you. Intriguingly, these idols do not look like pre-Islamic betels or anthropoid stones. Rather, they appear as if Buddhist statues seated in the lotus position and forming mudra gestures. As has been noted by previous scholars, this manuscript was made in Iran at a time when Islam was beginning to eclipse Buddhism and when Buddhist shrines and statues were ordered destroyed. It is thus not difficult to imagine that the story of Abraham's destruction of the idols could be viewed as a vindication of the Islamic point of view over the Buddhist idolaters of the time. The paradigm of Abrahamic iconoclasm thus has helped legitimate Islam's ascendancy over other religions, including secularism, in the past as well as today. In addition, this painting also displays obvious signs of wear. Two of the three seated idols appear to have been smudged by the viewer's fingers, leaving behind oxidized gold and silver pigment. I hope you can see just how damaged these two idols are here. They had been gold. Brown blemishes stretch horizontally across the face of the idol seated on the left, suggesting that it was targeted in a picture-based form of damnation. The painting's pigment damage therefore raises two important points. First, the picture's viewers appear to mimic Abraham by adding their own hands to this iconoclastic attack against the depicted idols. In other words, you can easily see how the viewers might be emulating Abraham by attacking the depiction of the idols themselves. And second, since Abraham remains in utterly pristine condition, no damage on Abraham, these same viewers obviously did not consider figural likenesses concomitant <coughs> with idols. Had this been the case, then the depiction of Abraham also would show signs of damage, while the painting itself, which clearly fulfills both pedagogical and religious needs, would not have been made in the first instance. Another painting included in a manuscript copy of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the Sir Nebi, made in Ottoman lands at the end of the 16th century, highlights the clear distinction that was drawn between figuration and idolatry. In this example, the veiled prophet is shown with his Muslim followers standing at the Kaaba, while a member of the Quraysh tribe bows down to worship a statuette of a pagan god. So here's Muhammad, his followers, the Quraysh, 
uh, Qureshi idolater and his statue right here, his pagan statue. In the text that accompanies this image, the author at Darir informs his readers that the pagan man prostrated before his idol, calling upon its deity to make a fool of Muhammad for having said that believing in an idol is superstitious and ignorant, and that paying devotional obeisance to one is an error. This contentious exchange in which an idolater seeks revenge upon Muhammad through an invoked sculptural image occurred immediately before the prophet rid the Kaaba of its idols of pagan Arab deities in order to reconsecrate it in honor of the one true God. In a vengeful act, Ottoman viewers of this painting smudged both idol and idolater depicted here in the process of aligning themselves with the prophet's entourage and message. Here, the prostrating pagan has almost entirely lost his face and his inclined body has been sliced in half by a voluminous smudge running across the horizontal. You can tell here how the smudges have, have really uh, been the result of several, I would say, iconoclastic um, agendas. Moreover, the standing gold statuette has been scrubbed in dynamic verticals, its facial features utterly annihilated. Through such ruinous acts, the viewers, much like Muhammad himself, repudiate idolatrous superstition and the pagan past through the positive mechanism of figural illustration. Once again, this type of painterly production and its subsequent handling proves that Muslim patrons, artists, and viewers could use the positive value of visual likenesses to expose, oppose, and combat the making and worshiping of idols. Moving forward, what other information does the Quran have to offer on pagan Arabian idols? What did they look like and how did they function during pre-Islamic times? Beyond, beyond the stories of Solomon, Moses, and Abraham, the Quran tends to mention idols alongside other materials and practices prohibited to Muslims. Such tabooed items include the eating of carrion, swine, and other animals slaughtered as offerings to sacred stones or betels, the drinking of wine, games of chance, and divining by arrows, and finally, the telling of lies. And these are all enumerated here. In these lists of rules governing moral behavior, a variety of terms are used for idol, above all, nusub or ansab, and wasan or awsan. And these are highlighted in blue. Noticeably absent from this Quranic inventory of banned items is the term tamathil, or figural likenesses, a semantic omission that, as previous scholars have argued, proves that the Quran censures the worshiping of idols while concurrently showing no hostility at all to the plastic or visual arts. As for the themselves, further information can be gleaned from extant objects, archeological remains, and the literary production of early Muslim writers. Among them, best known as the founder of the history of Arabian paganism is Ibn al-Kalbi, who composed his Kitab al-Asnam, or his Book of Idols, prior to his death in 821. In his of, Ibn al-Kalbi provides his readers with a plenitude of details about pre-Islamic pagan idols, the tribes and locations to which they were attached, and the ritual practices centered around them. He also offers linguistic explanations for the terms used for various idols. For example, he specifies that the ansab or nusub are in fact betels, that is, sacred stones endowed with life, so any stone at all. These stones were neither figural nor anthropomorphic. Rather, they were simply raised or chiseled, and they included long rocks, hewn quartz, or even black meteorites, sometimes placed within a temple known as a bait. Germain to Ibn al-Kalbi's discussion of ansab, of betels that are not anthropomorphic, 
is the so-called black stone, al-Hajjab al-Aswad, at the Kaaba. There is no doubt that this black stone is a holdover from pre-Islamic times when pagan Arabian Arabs performed circumambulation, what Ibn al-Kabi calls both tawaf and dawar, circumrotation, around the Kaaba while touching a number of stones, and these stones were known collectively as the ansab of the Kaaba. In addition to the practice of walking around and rubbing a sacred stone, the Kaaba's honorific appellations of al-Haram and Beit Allah also point to the pre-Islamic Arabian practice of ensconcing a sacred rock within a set-apart holy sanctum dedicated to a deity. In an Islamic register, however, the black stone is neither a deity in petrified form, nor is it alive in some fashion or another. Rather, it is said to be a piece of the temple or throne of God located in the celestial spheres, a copy of which is preserved in the earthly Kaaba, itself dubbed the house or temple of God, the Beit Allah. This meteorite is touched and kissed by pilgrims to the present day. Even though Saudi officers attempt to curb the practice and some members of ISIS go so far as to call the Kaaba a center of stone worship that must be raised to the ground. Such anxieties surrounding the Kaaba's litholatric, so stone worshiping origins, are not completely new or unfounded, however. Rather, they stretch back all the way to Omar, the prophet's companion and one of the first four rightly guided caliphs, who himself expressed concerns over the Muslim community's continued attachment to a black stone. Besides such sacred non-anthropoid stones, Ibn al-Kelbi also records other types of idols in his Kitab al-Islam. Most prominent among them are the types of idols mentioned in the title of his treatise, namely Asnam or Sanam in the singular. As our early historian of Arabian paganism specifies, asnam are statues in human form and usually made of wood, gold, or silver, whereas althan, or wathan in the singular, are images of humans made in stone. So we have both human and non-human sacred stones. In other words, althan are in essence figural ansab carved from stone, whereas asnam are shaped or constructed from non-lapidary materials, including precious stones. This, in turn, suggests a differentiation in size and purpose as well. One may assume that stone althan comprised larger and more public statuary, whereas the asnam were smaller in scale and kept either in secured sanctuaries or in private homes. Last but not least, it should be emphasized that in his text, Ibn al-Kelbi uses the term tamathil, or figural likenesses, as a neutral descriptor for material representations of living beings, rather than as a pejorative synonym for idols at the center of public of polytheistic worship. So tamathil is basically the equivalent of saying anthropomorphic in English at this point. That Ibn al-Kelbi mentions a number of idols made of wood burned within pagan homes during the rise of Islam points to a cult of, he of hearth gods, some of which were particular to tribes and families. Scholars have demonstrated that most asnam were roughly anthropoid and functioned as depictions of dead kin. For these reasons, a number of ancient anthropomorphic funerary steel, steles in the Arabian Peninsula not only served as grave markers, but also embodiments of ancestor idols, often shown with arms reverently crossed or decorated with markers of status, such as waistbands and swords, as you can see here. And these are uh, items that some of you might have seen in, in the roads of Arabia show. At the height of the emergence of Islam, their destruction was not begotten from a fear of their potential to come alive or perhaps a return of the dead. Rather, and shattering heralded the overthrow of ancestor worship, balkanized tribalism, and overt signs of class 
in favor of a larger faith community, a larger ummah, aiming for equality and unity in devotion to one single God. Whether in the 7th century or today, it thus can be argued that the act of idol breaking serves as the ultimate manifestation of taking an oath of loyalty to an emergent Islamic polity. While idols, that is images meant for religious devotion, remained prohibited in all spheres of Muslim life, the question of figural images with souls, or suwar zawat ruh, nevertheless proved problematic over the centuries. Various anecdotes about figural images are recorded in hadith collections in the uh, Prophet's sayings and deeds, which were compiled from the second half of the seventh century onward, that is well after the Prophet's death. Much like legal texts, the hadith contain conflicting opinions about images of animate beings. To no small degree, such contradictory information must have reflected presentist religious and political concerns among religious scholars and jurists, which could be projected backward in time via the collecting of Muhammad's sayings or the establishing of legal precedents. Such texts thus highlight how figural imagery in Islamic and many other religious cultures was subjected to perennial debates of interpretation with a reservoir of foundational texts that could be marshaled to support at times highly conflicting positions. Within the Islamic tradition, statement, statements found in the hadith collections and legal texts span the spectrum when it comes to the image issue. The hadith include clear anti-image invectives, including in the prophet's, prophet's oft-cited statement warning that makers of images, the musawwirun, will be punished on the day of judgment, at which time God will dare them to breathe a soul into their works. And I've transcribed it here on the screen for you. In light of this particular hadith, some Muslim writers go on to specify that images, that suwar, in the pre-Islamic period were used in lieu of God. Ergo, their use raised fears of a potential relapse to pagan practices and beliefs especially during the first century of Islam. However, with the passing of time and increased security in the faith, later elite Persian Muslim patrons and writers reassured artists that their craft was not to be considered sinful and therefore their, their souls should, quote, not be picked, pricked by the thorn of despair. And here I, I quote Dust Muhammad. So artists' souls should not be pricked by the thorn of despair. Images tend to appear in longer lists of other so-called abominations in the Hadith. For example, at, terms we, at times we read that angels do not enter a house containing an image, a bell, or a dog. In such cases, representations of figures with a soul, which might be put to use in pagan devotions, are aligned with two other symbols, that is, the bell, as a standard for the public presence and proclamation of Christianity, bells and crosses uh, were a big problem in the first century of Islam, and the dog as an animal allegory for contamination and uncleanliness. Yet we also find the stringent declaration mitigated in both practice and theory. In practice, by the fact that the prophet is recorded as having allowed the use of cushions ornamented with figural imagery in his house, and in theory, via statements by various scholars specifying that only the angels Gabriel and Michael refuse entry into the prophet's house, a place of revelations, and thus this particular hadith is deemed only applicable to Muhammad and not the wider community. To a certain extent, figural textiles highlight several intersecting problems when it comes to the parameters involved in determining the permissibility of depicting animate beings in Islamic traditions. These parameters include several variables, most notably the textile's mode of use and their specific location. In this regard, the Hadith includes several noteworthy statements regarding a figural fabric that belonged to Muhammad's wife, Aisha. The textile, we are told, was decorated with images or with a figure 
of a bird or a winged horse, and that it was acquired by Aisha while the Prophet was away on a trip. Upon his return, Muhammad saw the hanging cloth affixed to a door or a wall and ordered it pulled down. While some Muslim writers have interpreted this hadith as evidence for a prophetic ban on figural images, other hadiths further record the exchange and reveal a more nuanced position. These tell us, for example, that Muhammad ordered the hanging cloth pulled down, upon which he commanded Aisha to quote, and I believe I have it here, remove it from my sight, for its pictures keep occurring to my mind while I am praying, end quote. The images thus proved a distraction to the Prophet in his pious contemplation of a formless and all-encompassing God. Rather than jettison the cloth hanging, however, Aisha pulls it down, cuts it into pieces, and makes figural cushions out of its fragments. Another hadith takes the exchange even one step further by recording Aisha's statement, quote, God has not commanded us to clothe stones and clay. We cut the curtain and prepared two pillows out of it by <laughs> stuffing them with the fiber of date palms, and the prophet did not find fault with it, end quote. This episode in the Hadith is instructive in several respects. First arises the problem of pendant figures, that is, figures that are suspended or hung in some fashion or another. Enlivened by rays of light and gusts of wind, as well as facing the beholder at eye level or higher, such representations may be seen as glorified, the sources say muazzam, glorified as in glorified as a god as well as possessing a soul. In such a case, these dangling simulacra of animate beings may accidentally become the subject of devotional attention and prostration, and thus slide away from the field of pictorial representation into the tabooed terrain of idol worship. Here and elsewhere, the problem is one of ontological, ontological slippage whose onus falls squarely on the beholder's imagination and mode of conduct. The second problematic issue, besides something that is pendant, that is hanging, is that of cloaking. In pre-Islamic pagan rituals, raised stones and carved rocks were clad in textiles, coated in lime and clay, and circumrotated by pious visitants who declared their presence to the deity with the vocative lebeke, or here I am, which is a salutation that is still uttered uh, upon arrival at the Kaaba. During the seventh century, when confronted by Muslim forces, pagan Arabs issued battle cries by swearing upon sacred stones and their veils. And that sacred cry was al ansab wa fitr, right here, by the stones and by their veil. As a result, the veil or curtain could uh, not only could enliven an embroidered or woven figural image, but it also could camouflage the presence of a deity as well. That which lies beyond the veil, after all, remains a matter of spec speculative seeing and believing in a divine presence, and such a disposition evidently carried over into Islamic praxis as well via the kizwa, that is the dress, in wrapping the Kaaba itself God's earthly temple, and of course, a sacred reliquary uh, for the black stone. The third issue concerns the subject of figuration, the modality of its use, and its particular religious and cultural valences. Returning to the Hadith, we are informed that Aisha's hanging curtain possibly included a depiction of a winged horse. This motif is commonly found on Sasanian seals, silver dishes, and figural textiles, in which the fantastical creature acts as an emblem of Persian royalty or the star constellation known as Pegasus. For both political and religious reasons, this marker of Sasanian rule or symbol of astral worship could prove doubly, doubly problematic in an early Islamic context, especially if placed on display as a pendant image. 
Prohibiting the figural representation of a winged horse or fantastic creature, however, did not prove an immutable given. Rather, it had to be deduced by taking into account the depiction's theme, location, meaning, and use. It is for these reasons, as another hadith informs us, that when Muhammad witnessed Aisha on a different occasion playing with a doll in the shape of a horse with wings made of rags, but he did not scold her for having made an idol-like mobile image. Quite to the contrary, he asked her in jest, quote, a horse with wings? To which Aisha responded with the rhetorical question, have you not heard that Solomon had horses with wings? The prophet delighted in Aisha's witty reply and laughed so heartily that she said she could see his molar teeth. Textual sources provide a rich resource for the staking of diametrically opposed stances on figural imagery, each of which can be construed as theologically grounded in the prophet's sunnah or tradition. On the one hand, written texts are easily mined to support the assertion that an individual must abstain from the making and viewing of beings potentially endowed with life. On the other, the very same sources can serve to endorse the human production and enjoyment of visual likenesses. The Islamic visual corpus, for its part, is not wanting in the least. Indeed, there exist plenty of two-dimensional depictions of fantastical beasts, as well as three-dimensional renderings of animals or even automata from the earliest centuries until today. Among them are hybrid human-animal creatures, such as harpies, the Prophet Muhammad's human-headed flying steed named al Murak, which you can see here and here. This, by the way, is in the Ashmolean, so it's not too far away. And even images of the Saudi King Salman digitally enhanced with wings, as if he were a semi-angelic being hovering above Mecca and Medina, the two holy shrines of Islamdom. One might assume that the latter pictorial flight of fancy should not exist in light of government-sponsored Saudi Wahhabi fatwas that specifically prohibit Im imaginary pictures of winged horses and men with wings, there are fatwas on these subjects, an argument based on the sole citation of the hadith in which Muhammad asks Aisha to take down her curtain of a winged horse, a fantastical being. However, as the visual evidence so clearly indicates, such a legalist supremacist conception of Islam, to borrow uh, Shahab Ahmed's uh, conception of a legalist supremacist conception, does not constitute the driving force when it comes to crafting charismatic images in support of both religion and state. Hadith also pay attention to another one of Aisha's objects, namely her female dolls, her banat which we are told were brought into the Prophet's household upon, the, uh, upon Muhammad's marriage to her when she was nine years of age. Not only did Muhammad not prohibit these playthings, but rather he sat at her side while she amused herself with them. In later centuries, the issue of dolls also emerged in Islamic legal texts concerned with depictions of living beings. While some jurists, such as Ibn Hanbal, considered all images abominations and thus impermissible, so Ibn, uh, Ibn Hanbal prohibits dolls. Others, such as Ibn Hazm, not only allowed the manufacture and use of dolls, but also considered them a quote-unquote permissible good, halal hasan. While one jurist might rely on anti-image declarations in the Hadith, another can quarry the same corpus to accentuate the Prophet's approbatory behavior instead. Put more simply, opposing viewpoints find equal roots within the very same textual bedrock. Sliding on the wide spectrum from idol incarnate to educational tool, over the centuries the doll in particular has highlighted vastly divergent Islamic attitudes towards the depiction of human beings, among them three-dimensional figuration. Although the exact appearance of Aisha's dolls remains uncertain, it is possible that they represented the medieval, they resembled the medieval bone and ivory carved objects 
that were found in the excavations in Fustat. This is old Cairo. These juvenilia include carved limbs and facial features, as well as punctured holes that could enable the affixing of fabrics and jewels. I hope you can see this. Maybe some uh, earrings were attached. This could have been used for attaching clothing or else attaching the object to, to the body. Still other dolls, which you can see on the left, comprised a cross-shaped infrastructure into which the head was pinned and around which the body was molded with clay, rags, and other materials. These diminutive statues must have allowed children to engage in the imaginative uh, play of dress up, which continues unabated to the present day. As Charles Baudelaire notes in his seminal essay, The Philosophy of Toys, which I really recommend, such playthings essentially activate the child's metaphysical stirrings as they seek to investigate the sculpted images in her life. And Baudelaire says that the first time we really start to endow an object with, with life is when we're a child playing with toys. And so toys are almost the, the first idols that, that we have in terms of our metaphysical stirrings. Through the power of human imagination, these objects may seem to garner a semblance of sentience, that is, to exert life itself. This type of incarnational aesthetic is prompted by an object's outward appearance, as well as projected by its viewers into its very core. Both the visual qualities of figuration and the delimiting of sight therefore come together to yield a figural product which often operates within a larger religious and cultural ambit. In this regard, the example of the doll again proves quite fascinating. While medieval carved toys include chiseled fa facial features, some contemporary dolls are made without any facial traits whatsoever. Such dolls include the so-called Dini or religious doll named Ramesa in the center. In fact, I believe it's a British product if I'm not mistaken. Although marketed to British Muslim parents as Sharia compliant, Ramesa is in fact indebted to earlier Amish dolls that are also faceless and provided with head covers. So this, this kind of um, niche of the market, I would say, um, was inspired by Christian educational enrichment materials that you see in, in quite conservative uh, Christian spheres. Whether in Muslim or Christian ultra-conservative arenas, statements from the Hadith and the Bible are therefore selectively brought to the fore to support child-friendly products whose facelessness is argued by some as prohibiting it from potentially becoming a graven image or idol, either from a spirit emanating from within the human likeness, so without facial features, you can't have a spirit, you can't have a head, or alternatively, as aroused by the imaginative vision of the child, who it should be added, not infrequently in these cases, will reach for a black pen in order to fill in these most inviting of blank slates. I know you're all filling you're all filling this in in your mind's eye. The child will do it with a pen. The conundrum thus continues to loom large all the while as the white tabula rasa entices the inscription of life itself. Over the centuries, the representation of the human face has proved of deepest concern within debates over figuration, since both the soul and human life are thought to stem and exude from the head. For these reasons, Hadith transmitters and legal scholars developed a number of strategies to hinder the inspiriting of images and thus their ensuing worship as idols. One widely accepted tactic included the removal of the head or qat al-ra'as, a practice advocated by Ibn Abbas, Ibn Hanbal, Ibn Qudama, and modern Saudi clerics based on the basic premise that a figural image cannot be considered an animate being if it has no head. For these reasons, free modern jurists advocated for the ripping down of hanging figural curtains, the destruction of dolls, and the removal of heads from figures painted in fresco on bathhouse walls. And these are all attested to in, in the text. 
Muslim legal, legal experts and writers have expressed, ex expressed anxiety about pendant figural images above all. While some state that such items must be torn down and destroyed, others opine that they should be laid flat on the ground and trodden upon. Still others, especially those of a more she inclination, argue that small scale figural images on robes and carpets are acceptable even in mosques, but that those located in the Qibla direction must be removed. Besides suggesting that figural images may have ornamented some pre-modern mosques, these statements echo those of the Prophet Muhammad, who found Aisha's hanging curtain a distraction in prayer and thus had it removed and transformed into cushions. The pillow's repurposed figural imagery was retained, re reclined upon, its removal from the suspended realm of exaltation, negating the signs of life as begotten by light and wind effects. Beyond this textual evidence, visual materials highlight other strategies adopted by the artists themselves. For example, some figural fabrics made in 16th century Iran have woven or knotted into their structures depictions of crowned young men whose faces are left entirely blank or whose facial features are turned upside down as if an early harbinger of today's smiley faces and emoticons. emoticons. I hope you can see this. We have no face at all and an upside down smiley face right here. These pictorial stratagems are carefully considered and executed from the beginning of the artwork's inception in order to ensure its theological defensibility on the one hand and to protect it from subsequent manipulation and destruction on the other. Other evidence suggests viewers' later alterations of figural imagery, including those illustrating pre-modern manuscripts. For example, some copies of Al-Hariri's Makamat, his assemblies, many of which were produced in the Jazira area, so Syria, Upper Mesopotamia, during the 13th century, include large black lines drawn across the throats of the depicted figures. This is quite evident right here. Such lines were added by a viewer at a later date, perhaps even the 20th century, I should mention perhaps in order to symbolically gag a spirit lying in potenza. It should be underscored, however, that this unease with figural imagery is nowhere to be found in the manuscript's original paintings, where characters dynamically burst off the page, their facial features fully visible and conveying a wide range of emotions. Until today, scholars have been keen to emphasize textual and visual sources that underscore the practice of removing the head, which we can see here, which is couched as particularly distinct in Islamic traditions. Such iconoclastic insertions, nevertheless, can be found in other religious cultures, including Christianity and Judaism. In addition, an overemphasis on such destructive rather than creative acts, in essence, skews results in favor of supporting the presumption that Islamic cultures are either passively or actively adverse to images of animate beings. Just as theologians and clerics might cherry pick hadiths in support of a particular stance, we as scholars and students of Islamic art must be wary of how we select and put to interpretive use a particular corpus of evidence. In this respect, the illustrated manuscripts offer a cautionary tale where one scholar might choose to emphasize a black line removing heads, another instead may decide to illustrate a different folio in which an artist has inserted figural imagery that was either left incomplete or lost due to damage. So here we have potentially damage done to the folio and someone has gone in and completed it. So he has created images rather than destroyed them. Here, bodies, faces, and eyes, some of which appear rather Picasso-like in their cubistic <laughs> rendering, complete the scene to the viewer's satisfaction. This insertion proves in diametric to the former example on the left, in which the black ink line does not create or complete a vision of life, but rather suppresses it from the throat down. 
As we thus move forward with a discussion of image making in Islamic traditions, we must be cautious to not overemphasize later destructive acts over and beyond the creative drives that have propelled both the creation and reparation of figural imagery over the centuries. To do so would be in essence to stake a neoconservative stance by ignoring or marginalizing evidence that disproves the false presumption that Islamic cultures are inherently antagonistic to the depiction of animate beings. Thus come full circle, the crux of the matter appears a rather simple one, and it is this. The creation of an image of a human being must not be conflated with the worshipping of an idol. While there may be instances in which figuration and paganism might overlap, there exist many more cases in which they diverge substantially. For example, painterly depictions of the prophets Abraham and Muhammad confront, confronting pagan objects and practices reveal how the pictorial mode can offer a positive form of argumentation against idolatry per se. In addition, the existence of figural statuary, fantastical beasts, and figural textiles display a creativity and joy around image making that has thrived in Islamic lands over the centuries, enduring until the present day. This said, as in all religious cultures, certain anxieties prove tenacious, and therefore both textual proclamations and visual materials shed light on both the problems and the possibilities as these relate to the depiction of figural images with souls. As for the problems, the lure of the seductive arts and the imitation of Christian traditions transcend now long gone fears of lapsing into paganism, even if the latter may be leveraged for rhetorical purposes within situations of conflict. And as for the more promising possibilities, one thing remains certain. Figural images are here to stay and they promise to multiply across the media. Their power will continue to cause both dread and delight, revealing the extent to which figural imagery will always be subject to debate and always will remain an open-ended question. Thank you very much. <laughs>